All right, it's time to get things started. I'm Sheila Wildman. Uh, I'm Associate Director of the Health Law Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the final seminar in our Health Law and Policy Seminar Series this academic year. And what better way to talk off uh, an extraordinary pair of speakers than with our own, all right, not anymore, but we'll always claim her as our own, no matter how long or far she strays, uh, Colleen Flood. Colleen is a Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy. She's a Professor of Law at the University of Toronto and is cross-appointed with the Department of Health Policy Management and Evaluation and the School of Public Policy at the U of T. From 2006 to 2011, she was the Scientific Director of the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. As many of you will know, uh, Colleen's health law scholarship is strongly interdisciplinary, bringing together legal, economic, and political analysis to address comparative health care policy, public-private financing of health care systems, health care reform, and accountability and governance issues more broadly. She's authored numerous articles, book chapters, and reports, and is author and editor of eight books, including a refreshing, uh, even effervescent textbook in administrative law, an area sometimes <laughs> grievously miscast as dry and boring. Uh, I'm an admin law teacher too, so thank you, Colleen, for setting the world straight on admin law's effervescence. Uh, Colleen's extensive scholarship has been central to informing some of Canada's mo most pressing health policy debates including the ongoing debates about the future of our public health care system. The importance of Colleen's work to these central political questions reflects her ability to produce scholarship of the highest quality, painstakingly thorough and rigorous in its application of interdisciplinary, international, and comparative uh, law methods. It also uh, reflects her uncommon skills in knowledge translation, so taking hard-won insights and making them accessible and relevant these are skills Colleen has drawn upon as a teacher as well, one who has shaped the aspirations and careers of a huge raft of health lawyers, policymakers, and academics in and beyond Canada. Of course, it all started right here at Dalhousie at the Health Law Institute. Uh, While well, some might claim that Colleen's brilliant trajectory started in New Zealand, where she was born and began life as a baby lawyer, uh, or perhaps at the University of Toronto, where she did her graduate work, we like to remind her of her maritime roots, <laughs> and more specifically, her time as Associate Director of the Health Law Institute from 1997 to 1999. Performative years. <laughs> and ours. Uh, it was in 1997 that Colleen launched this seminar series with then HLI Director Jocelyn Downey as the inaugural lecturer. Today tops off the 17th year of this successful series. So you can see why Colleen Flood is an honorary lifetime member of the Health Law Institute uh, and why we're so delighted to have her with us today. With that, let me turn you over to you. Wow, um, that almost sounded like a retirement. <laughs> And uh, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs when we're getting to that point in my life, but uh, I'm really so happy to be here and um, I want to thank Sheila and the Health Law Institute for organising for, for this uh, event and also to Chris O'Connor with the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation who also helped contribute and all the other donors and benefactors that help the Health Law Institute and the, and the Health Law Seminar Series. Uh, to go on this year and for the last 17 years. So um, I'm thrilled to see what a wonderful series it, it is and has become over the years, and it's just great to see that. So thank you for, thank you for that and for having me here as your last speaker. So I better do something really amazing, I guess. So I'll try. Um, so the topic uh, of my, my paper, and really this uh, relates to a book that I've been working on that's coming out any day now is putting health to rights, a global comparative study. So, um, you know, most of you in this room are probably very progressive types, I imagine. And when you think about health human rights, you think that you are promoting them, or human rights more broadly, that you are promoting them in order to make a difference. Right? You, you want to improve the lives of people. Uh, and with health human rights, though, I think we're coming to a point where we have to actually question whether that's the case. And so that's what's animated our, 
uh, endeavor here. So, well, why are we asking this question? First of all, the proliferation of um, health rights and health human rights, socioeconomic rights around the world is really quite extraordinary over the last couple of decades. So, for example, in a, a recent study found that more than 90% of 195 constitutions currently in force contain at least one, one social or economic right. That's a lot of constitutions. And they go on to find that health rights, health human rights, are in existence in some 68% of constitutions um, and that they're enforceable in 40%. So sometimes you have a right to health, but it's a bit of a loosey-goosey thing that, you know, we will promise to do our best at some point in the future, uh, you know, unaccessible. But there are in 40% of them, they are enforceable, justiciable, justiciable anyway. But despite all of that, uh, we still continue to see enormous disparities in health and in access to health care around the world and within health care systems. So, for example, five, um, health spending per capita for the top 5% of the world's population is nearly 4,500 times more of that of the lowest 20%. Uh, two and a half million people die annually from vaccine preventable diseases and close to seven million children under the age of five died in 2011 from malnutrition and mostly preventable diseases. And so I think these, you know, all, they're so familiar, maybe they're just, kind of, you're kind of over it. But if we think we're making a difference with health human rights, then why isn't this changing? So that's what set us out to on our exploration to try to figure that out. And so what I'm going to do to you, with you is present you some of the work that we've been working on over the last four years to explore this question. And really what we're asking is, does the litigation or does health human rights and the litigation thereof, is it progressive or is it regressive? Is it actually making a difference for the most vulnerable in the world or, to put it colloquially, is it just giving middle class and wealthy people more stuff they don't probably really need? You know, so is it leading the charge of the redistribution of resources in the way that we might hope as human rights lawyers or health human rights lawyers or is it being used for other purposes and why and when and how uh, when we see success can we replicate it? So. We went on a tour, uh, which is always a great thing when you're an academic, right? So in selecting um, the countries uh, for study, what we wanted to do was to include a diverse range of countries from around the world, some which have constitutions where there is an explicit right to health care as part of the constitution, some that have uh, con written constitutions where rights to health have been read into those constitutions, some that have not constitutional rights to health care but statutory rights to health care, so in regular legislation. And then some where there are no, apparently no rights to health care at all. So we wanted to map um, these uh, different approaches to health human rights. And then what the value added that we wanted to bring to this, because a number of people have been starting to look at this question of human rights and the impact of health human rights, was to really ground it in the context of the healthcare system. Uh, you know, that, that's the value added that I have. What I know about is how healthcare systems work and their interaction, particularly between the public and private aspects thereof. So we wanted to marry up understandings, deeper and rich understandings about how healthcare systems work and the public-private divide with the impact of health human rights and how that is affecting actually on the ground the healthcare systems and in particular the division between public and private. Right? So because of course actually figuring out what is really regressive and is really progressive is very difficult. So that was our, our metric for uh, our, our measure to sort of uh, provide for progressive and regressivity. So what we did was we looked at bundles of countries in three different ways. So first of all, we um, 
uh, along a spectrum of public to private. So at one end of the spectrum, we have public or tax finance countries, and these are countries where the healthcare systems are largely funded through taxation revenues, through uh, which public finance. Um, and our representative countries here, as you see, is the UK, New Zealand, Canada, and Sweden. Then moving to the middle, um, these are what we call social health insurance or managed competition. Sorry, the competition part fell off the slide. Um, these countries are quite complicated. For those of us who live over here, it's maybe hard to understand how these ones work. But these systems are often called public systems because healthcare is universal. Everybody who lives in these countries has a right to healthcare, but it is not tax financed. It's, well, it's partly tax finance. It's mostly funded by way of contributions from your income and contributions from your employer as a percentage of your income. So it is more or less progressive. And then it's usually heavily regulated. And so in Europe, we call the insurers, the providers, their sickness funds. Right? They're the sort of public insurer. But increasingly, as I'll discuss in a minute, what we're seeing is also a transition of these, from these countries to what we call managed competition. So more private, um, private uh, operation within the public system. So these are our, our middle countries, if you like, on the spectrum from public to private. They tend to, although they don't have to, have more of a role for co-payments and so forth. So they're a little less progressive generally than these ones, but not always. And then at the far end of the spectrum, we have countries that are mostly middle-income countries, apart from the United States, which is sort of in a category of its own. But these are countries that have a public health care system generally, but it is so impoverished or small, there is an enormous role for the private sector. So we call these mixed public and private systems. Right. So... The first thing to note about this uh, is that our sort of our vision at the beginning of drawing the divide, the spectrum between public and private, is that these public and private categories are not hard and fast, and they're increasingly blurred. All right, so uh, there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and you see that perhaps from my little discussion of the social health insurance system, they look public in the sense that everybody has health care, but these are non-for-profit private entities that actually run the health care system, the sickness funds. And increasingly across a number of countries, these are transitioning from not-for-profit to for-profit private insurers, albeit regulated. And this is a modality of reform called managed competition. But again, uh, you have private for-profit insurers, but it's universal and it's regulated. Everybody gets coverage, but there's an enormous role for private insurers. So it's public, but it's private. But from a redistributive perspective, it's redistributive because it's regulated uh, to hell and back in the, in the proper systems. Right? But there's always this opportunity for more privatisation just because of the fact that you have these large private for profit actors that are at the very core of your system. So what you have seen, for example, with Obamacare is a movement from a lack of insurance altogether to this notion of regulated private health insurance. It's progressive, but you're using private health insurers to get there. Right? Same with Taiwan. Uh, no, you know, no public scheme, no universal scheme a movement to create that, regulating private health insurers under a universal scheme. It's public and it's private. So what do we call that? It's a blur, really. And it's a little hard to say, well, on the one hand, it's regressive, but it also has the potential... Oh, sorry, on the one hand, it is progressive. You're moving to universal care. But on the other hand, within, the seeds, within it are the seeds for a lot of potential regressivity down the track. Um, so the yin and the yang, right? So... That's one thing that we noticed um, straight out of the gate, that this was going to make life a lot more complicated uh, than we had perhaps first hoped. And then the other thing to note uh, straight out of the gate is that the prevalence of enforceable rights to health care is the inverse of what you might imagine. So countries with robust public health care systems do not have an enforceable right to health care. It is very prevalent in these systems. 
Basically, the more private your system, the more likely you are to have an enforceable right to health care. So that's a puzzle, right? That, and, you know, which is one of the reasons we set out on this endeavour. What the hell? All right? So it doesn't seem to be doing what we would hope. But, of course, that ignores the larger socioeconomic and political realities of these systems. These countries are mostly middle-income countries. These are mature welfare states. Over time, their healthcare systems have developed without the need necessarily for an enforceable right to health care. It has just emerged <coughs> over time as part of policy. It's not, we don't actually have a right to health care in the Canadian context per se, at least a progressive right, but it is a matter of policy. These countries are often seeking to really craft a new and radical redistributive agenda post-apartheid, post-revolution, post-communism, they try to do something different. And so the ones with the enforceable right to health care, they're looking to make a difference. So in a sense, we also realise we kind of asked the wrong question, unfortunately. <laughs> so that will be another book. But <laughs> what we really needed to know was what would be the um, alternative. So what will be the alternative in Colombia, for example, or Venezuela, in the absence of a constitutional right to health care. What would have happened without it? Would it have been worse? Is it making a difference in the system that we have? So we needed to know the counterfactual, and of course that's extremely difficult to do. So that's, you know, just straight out of the gate some of the things that we found. Um, now, I'll just talk to you. What, what happened was that we got together 16 people from around the world who, um, to a greater or lesser extent, look and sound like me, um, in that they are people who are legal scholars but also are really, you know, dig healthcare systems mm -hmm. so that they really are imbued in it, they understand the healthcare system and they're able to explain in a fairly cogent and simple way what is happening in their healthcare system, the structure, the dynamics, the economics and so forth, and then have something to say about the impact of healthcare rights in that system. So that actually wasn't that easier a task to get 16 collaborators together from around the world. And then we had a couple of workshops, one in Toronto and one in Israel where my colleague, my co-author, uh, A.L. Gross, um, is from, and to workshop papers. And, and this we did it over and over and over again, trying to develop themes and, and try to, to get some resonance across um, these uh, different countries. So I'll just mention five of the themes that we, um, very briefly, that we asked our authors to look at. So the first one was, does litigation undermine a fair distribution of resources? Litigation of health human rights. Um, and um, as I said, frequently health human rights is assumed to be progressive and law is seen as rectifying injustices that result in the more vulnerable in society being allocated an unfair share of resources due to economic inequality or prejudice, discrimination, racism, homophobia. But we also realise that health rights litigation that is very much focused on the individual can destabilise public systems committed to solidarity and redistribution. And that was what we wanted to find out. Is that something that was happening in your jurisdiction? So, you know, if you, we look at a lot of the litigation that happens in a number of countries, it's about relatively middle class and wealthy people, relatively, seeking access to new drugs and devices and technologies and expensive cancer drugs and so forth and so on. It's infrequently about very vulnerable people getting access to health care that they need. I think in Canada, access on the part of Aboriginal people to the health care services that they need. Have we seen a case? No. So, um, so I think that that was an important part of our, our, our theme that we asked each of the authors to address. To what extent is litigation resulting in a fair distribution of resources, as you see it, or an unfair distribution of resources, as you see it. Um, so the, the, the concern is that an undue focus on upholding individual rights may cam camouflage the distributive nature of the decision and encourage disregard for the needs of others. 
It may impede the larger social and political processes through which difficult distributive choices are made. That's our worry. So the challenge then is to articulate health rights in a way that both advances mutual so social dependence, our dependence on each other, our, par our, our, our interaction as part of a collectivity, while giving due consideration to the health needs of an individual. It's got to be a balance. Right? So now related to that though, a, a number of us were also concerned about, and I think this is, you know, you frequently see, I'll just jump over this one actually, um, a concern that, well, that may be true, so it may be that government is desperately trying hard to um, shift resources, you know, and allocate resources from uh, the healthy to the sick and from the wealthy to the poor, and you don't want hyper-individualised litigation to necessarily upset that balance. But then on the, other hand, on the other hand, there could be claims that government just isn't putting enough money full stop, not enough resources, full stop, into this endeavour. And so that's part of the problem. And I think actually courts are generally sort of sympathetic to that, and the public more generally are sympathetic to that. Oh, we just need to put more money into it. So I think that's actually a problem. But nonetheless, it can be true, and I have a lot more sympathy for this claim, in systems where there is huge inequalities between rich and poor. Right? In some of these middle-income countries, as I'll discuss briefly, in India and South Africa, the, this, the disparities between rich and poor and who benefits from the private system um, and who are left in the public system is just amazing, you know, staggeringly awful. So uh, here, perhaps, there is much more of a sense that the claim should be that governments should be much more active about their redistributive agenda. Things need to be happening. There, you know, there may be a universal system, there may not. If there's not a universal system, we need to see that. And then we need to be thinking about how to get the resources that are clearly maldistributed into the hands of those who most need it. So this is also something that people were looking and exploring with um, in their papers. Now related to both of these topics is the question of access to justice. Um, clearly litigation is often extremely expensive and frequently those who are most disadvantaged in the allocation of health and health care are not represented in case law. So what modalities and other arrangements are there in place within a healthcare system with a health human right that actually allows the most vulnerable to bring their rights and have them enforced? Right? And how is that playing out in the system? When generally it is, as I said, it's not that great. Now, there are some examples, however, where Constitutional courts have really given power to health human rights and other human rights. I'm going to discuss this in a minute in the context of Colombia. But it doesn't always play out as you might think. So just hold that thought for a little bit. Um, I'll skip over this. I could tell you the story. but I'll. And then the other thing we asked our uh, folks to do was to think about the larger socioeconomic context of, and political context in particular, of a decision. <coughs> And that is that to think past the point of a decision. So we go to court, we win a case, woohoo, party, right? Uh, but then, as Jocelyn will tell you, it plays out in the political context, and it turns out you haven't really won, right? Aldridge is a good example here in Canada, translation services for the deaf, yet across the country there aren't translation services for the deaf in hospitals and um, healthcare institutions. It's not like they haven't had time, it was in 1997. But and on the other hand, uh, another case here is Auton um, uh, services for autistic kids. They lost the case in the Supreme Court of Canada, yet the public voice was behind you know, I, I, the, the folks who brought this challenge, who look a lot like you and I in this room. And from coast to coast, all provinces have moved, well, almost all provinces have moved to fund this therapy, despite the decision by the Supreme Court that there was no need to fund it. So sometimes you win and you win, sometimes you win and you lose, sometimes you lose and you win, and sometimes you lose and you lose. All right, so we need to look past the point of the decision further on down the track to see what really happened. Now, we weren't always successful in that because that's actually a huge amount of work to try to really understand what the impact is of a particular decision. All right, so we asked our authors to also uh, do that as well. 
So those were some of the themes that we asked our authors to explore. So let me get to some of the kind of larger normative um, conclusions that we reached. So, so what we found was that like previous comparative studies that have gone down this path, it's actually very difficult to draw hard and fast conclusions, that's for sure. But we can say with certainty that uh, health human rights and the litigation thereof can be used for both progressive and regressive uh, ends. And much depends on the context of the particular healthcare system, the judicial response to the health human right or the human right, how they interpret it, and their understandings of how healthcare systems work, which is often not very good. So in developed countries, what we see is a, a, matura a maturation of public health systems and concerns about growing health care costs. You'll be familiar with this mantra in Canada. And so this results in tensions over people bringing claims to court around expensive new drugs and therapies and technologies. But Concerns about stability and sustainability and the ageing population also seems to empower ever-increasing claims for privatisation. Right? And we are seeing that across the country as well. So, a health human right in the Canadian context or in uh, one of the other mature welfare states could possibly be used as a shield to these privatisation agendas, a properly crafted health human right. What we have so far, as most of you know, is an interpretation of Section 7 that provides a, a negative right in terms of health care, i.e. government get out the hell out of my way so that I can buy private health insurance or access health care as I <coughs> see fit and not as you see fit. And this case, there are more cases coming up in British Columbia, a particular case in British Columbia, but other cases across the country where they are using Section 7 in a negative way to try to strike down the various protections that um, are in place for the public health care system. So here in Canada, we are most definitely seeing a health human right being used as a, a re to regressive ends as opposed to progressive ends. So the trick would be, um, if we were able to persuade the Supreme Court to interpret Section 7 in a more positive way, to be a health human right that is not about hyper-individualised rights to health care, but about protecting these larger norms of equity and solidarity and sharing in a public health care system. So that's what we're seeing in wealthy countries. In middle-income countries, what we tend to see more is um, where they have a constitutional right to health care is more of a hyper-individualised claim. So individuals coming to court and bringing claims for this drug or this device. And an example of where this has played out in particular uh, in a very interesting and perhaps worrisome or, or not so worrisome way, depending on your perspective, is in Colombia. So Colombia, three things have happened. First, they moved towards a managed competition system. So they had more of a social health insurance system, sort of a nascent one. And they believed they were very into sort of the idea of the market, et cetera, et cetera, trying to corral it for progressive ends. So they put in place a managed competition system. So recall, this is competing private health insurers. Everybody has insurance. Everybody's covered. It's regulated so private health insurers don't dump you, don't treat you like they normally treat you. They have to be good guys in this managed competition system. These kinds of systems naturally um, allow you to basically bring more litigation because it's almost like a private law contract between the private insurer and you as an individual, as a beneficiary. There's also a determination of a central core of benefits that each insurer has to provide you. And the process of determining that central core of benefits is also ripe for challenge, judicial challenge. So there are a variety of opportunities in these kinds of systems where you try to bring in more private into the public to bring more litigation. 
But it's maybe not the kind of litigation that you want. It's about you haven't done this, you haven't given me this drug, you haven't given me this device. So that's the Colombian situation. What happened was that in Colombia these private health insurers weren't delivering. They weren't providing the ba basic basket of services. They were struggling to do so. So the Constitutional Court steps in and very aggressively says, one, we read in a right to health as part of the general provisions of the Constitution. It's not explicit, but they read it in. Two, we're going to empower this constitutional right to health care through what they call a tutela action. And a tutela action says basically screw all the you know, uh, discovery and uh, standing and all that sort of stuff. You get to go to court. You get to go to court whenever you want to to bring your health human right claim. It's just like little you know, town halls and that sort of stuff. You can bring your tutela action. Uh, from 1999 to 2010, there were 1 million tutela claims in healthcare. 85% of them successful. Now, it's got teeth because not only do you bring your tutela claim and it's cheap and easy and effective, so you've solved the access to justice problem, right? Solve that access to justice problem. Then the Constitutional Court says, and if you, Vaughan Black, as the bureaucrat, um, don't give me my drug or device, you're in contempt of court and you're going to jail. We could just put them in there anyway. <laughs> so, very strong, right? Fabulous, right? Health human rights, guys? Woohoo! <laughs> Not so fabulous. The Colombian system buckles at the knees, right? Because it's costing so much money. Because what happens is, as well, the pharmaceutical companies realize this is great. We can game this system. We don't want the public formulary to include our drug on their system. We want a tutela remedy because then they have to pay the price that we want to charge, not some negotiated price between the public insurer and the drug company, whatever price we want. Boom, 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 one million. Right? Fascinating. So from a health human rights perspective, this is nirvana. From a health systems equity solidarity perspective, this is terrible. Right? Because a lot of these people are bringing claims for new drugs, new devices. These are mostly drugs, devices that the middle class want. Even though the tutela is open for everybody and the barriers are down, still the people that mainly bring the claims are more middle class than the poor. So this is a sort of salutary story. But then on the other hand, there's something you know, so powerful about this. The Constitutional Court then wades back in. Okay, well, we've got it wrong. So they deliver through a recent judgment a bunch of decrees to the government about how they need to re basically reform their healthcare system to get rid of a bunch of the problems that they feel are generating so many tutela actions. So this Constitutional Court is just not reviewing policy. They're making policy. They're making health care policy. They hold participatory <coughs> forums where they have governments and the people and physicians, they kind of all come together and they discuss what the reforms should be. It's simply amazing from our rather impoverished idea of litigating constitutional rights. This is way more fun. <laughs> but um, we see, I think, then some of the concerns that we have about it, but also some of the potential power. Okay, uh, so here's a, I don't know why, I should have showed you that before. Um, so the danger of health rights then, if health rights are treated as unconditional and not limited by resource capacity, this can put an unsustainable burden on the public insurers and undermine their ability to act as a wise steward of public resources through negotiating prices or resisting patent extensions and so forth. If you can't say no, if I'm a public insurer and I can't say no to the physicians or the nurses or the drug companies or the device manufacturers, if I can't say no, get out of town, I am not paying your rubbishy price, you cannot run an efficient and effective and equitable healthcare system. You will be bankrupt, pretty lickety split. So, but on the other hand, without a constitutional health right or a very modest approach to constitutional health rights, such as a very modest approach as such as we see in India and South Africa, 
You know, not, notwithstanding there are some, you know, a couple of you know, breathtakingly fabulous cases that we all sort of cling on to, for example, in the South African context. You know, the reality in South Africa is that apartheid continues in the healthcare system. The public system looks after 90% of the population. The private system looks after 10% of the population. The private system has 70% of the medical care personnel. This figure has got worse over time since the advent of a health human right, not better. Right? So there's something you know, not enough. I mean, of course, for example, the treatment action campaign case, millions of babies were likely saved as a result of that decision where Mbeki as an AIDS denialist you know, would refuse to fund uh, Neprovin to prevent mother-to-child transmission and the Constitutional Court overturned that decision. That's a very, very important decision. But it's clearly not enough. It is simply not enough. So, should, it, should they go bigger? Should they do more? Should they be looking at policy? So this is where we get, you know, how far should they go? So, what we think is that where we have, um, so let me just back up, where we see courts more comfortable, apart from the Colombian situation, to intervene in healthcare is where it is an individual bringing a claim for a particular drug or device or a treatment. You know, this is, you know, the, the little guy against the government. And they feel more emboldened to intervene there. When it comes to policy stuff, they're much more reluctant. Right? So, um, we think it should be pretty much the round the other way. So, for individual claims, we think that the courts should be more cautious than we are currently seeing them being. That they should, however, as we do see in the UK, um, insist on fair processes and fair mechanisms for decision making. So more in the spirit of administrative law. That we want to see that there is transparency and openness with how courts make decisions about what is publicly funded and what isn't publicly funded. That they take into account relevant factors, for example, your actual healthcare needs. Um, the efficacy of the treatment, the cost of the treatment, and that it is in a relative framework. Right? So this is what we see the courts doing in England. They are insisting that governments and government agencies actually uh, follow a fair process, and they will review on the substance of things where it is completely unreasonable, the decision that has been made, but it's mostly about insisting on a fair process. And we think that is by far the better way to go when it comes to individual claims for treatment. However, when it comes to um, uh, policy decisions, <clears throat> there we see, when we look across all of these jurisdictions, that courts are more likely to act as a shield than a sword. So, Obamacare, as an example, even if it was by the faintest of margins, the Supreme Court did uphold Obamacare at the end of the day, which the universal mandate that everybody had to basically buy private health insurance. Similarly, in Taiwan, there was a challenge to the universal mandate, the requirement that everybody buy private health insurance and be part of a universal system. And the court in Taiwan, the Supreme Court in Taiwan, also found just that that should be upheld. So where they do take, where governments do take progressive measures, um, even if it's only just, courts will usually uphold it. But where they're taking r retrogressive steps, so for an example in Israel, they have introduced a huge raft of co-payments at point of service, something like 30%, which when you think about if you're having a major cardiac event or cancer treatment, these are thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for some people at point of service. It means you have to pay this out of your pocket if you don't have private health insurance. 
So a challenge went up to the Israeli Supreme Court around this, but it did not succeed. Right? So where it is regressive policy on the part of governments, courts are not overturning it. We think they should take a closer look. And we think they should do that on the basis that not that, they, you know, not that they necessarily need to make policy, as we see in Colombia, but that as part of a health human right, the very integral part of it is this concepts of accessibility, particularly for the most vulnerable, and concepts of solidarity and universality. Right? That is key part of a health human right, and that, if properly formulated, is what courts should, uh, what courts should be aspiring to in adjudicating on health human rights. So being so nervous about wading into policy, we think, is inappropriate if we had a well-crafted health human right that would empower them to do this. Right? Not about individuals kind of getting whatever they want on any particular day. Not that that isn't important and doesn't require just consideration, but it should be about, in that case, making sure that there are fair processes and a reasonable path for decision making. But when it comes to these bigger policy questions that really go to the heart of what I consider, and I think most people do, a health human right, accessibility, particularly for the most vulnerable, universality and solidarity, I don't think they should have any qualms. I've, I've kind of got there. I used to have qualms, but less and less so, particularly as I look more and more at other jurisdictions, apart from uh, our own um, and middle-income countries. Um, so I'll just go back then uh, to this. So then I think the challenge, as I said, is how to articulate health rights in a way that both advances mutual social dependence while giving due consideration to the health needs of an individual. How to strike that balance, I think, is the key for us uh, going forward. And that is it. Thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you covered it up. <laughs> Well, I think that could be a useful thing to do. We didn't do that, but I suspect it would probably fall along the gradient as we saw it. Um, so, uh, you know, li uh, Israel, Canada, sort of more liberal kind of leaning countries um, would tend to be on our left side of our spectrum without uh, constitu positive constitutional rights to health care. <coughs> The countries on the right with more nascent public systems, as I said, you know, many of them, for example, in Latin America, are in a place where they are grounding new constitutions. These are new constitutions. And so they are including socio and economic uh, rights on the same level as political and civil rights. I didn't talk about, you know, why we've seen this rise of socio economic rights. But Obviously, it is partly a story of um, uh, scholars and activists and policy folks from middle-income countries and developing countries saying, you know, great, you know, I, I have my lovely liberal rights, but I'm starving to death. It's, it's not, they need to be on the same par, and this has been, you know, a force that's been moving and moving and moving uh, towards it and seeing it in those constitutions. But maybe it would help. So, but then I ask you, so, and to what end? Then would um, would that help us uh, better think about how to solve the problem of uh, how we're interpreting a, a socio-economic economic right, or how we could interpret our health human right? Yeah, I, mean, I think it, it enables you perhaps. You are just sort of building solidarity into the concept of. The health right. Yeah. Whereas if it's in the constitution, as a core value, you might not have to make that conceptual move, and that might be uh, more powerful because what you're what you're fighting against over with the Canadian charter, for instance, with its 
it's so, so dominant liberalism, yes. um, it's individualism, y you're countering. Mm. No, I think that's, that's true, although, of course, when I think about, you know, constitutional reform in Canada, you know, okay. Uh, so what we really want to do is empower and embolden the court to interpret Section 7 in the Canadian context. Oh, yeah, as a, yeah. As a strategy, yeah. you, you can't try and get you know, to put solidarity right. into the chart, right. but, but in terms of understanding, the, the, the greater the understanding we have of what's going on and what works right. just may help us develop different strategies. And so... If well, um, so the countries that do have a broad raft of economic and social rights, so, you know, you'll be well familiar with South Africa. It includes, it's not, you know, there's a lot of aspirational stuff, but it includes the big sort of social determinants of health. Um, so not so much a concept, as sort of a standalone concept of solidarity. And to be frank, I'm not sure you would need that in every domain, but you do need it in healthcare. I don't need solidarity and access to cell phones. Right or in you know uh, flat screen TVs or even in maybe oh, God forbid access to legal education. But in healthcare, I think you do, and that's not just because of e e equality and equity concerns. Although I think those are paramount, but also from economic perspective, that solidarity and equity are actually very beneficial from an economic perspective as well. So I think there are a lot of reasons why. But from health human rights perspective, it's very clear. So, yeah. But you know what's interesting as well? Um, I don't know if many of you have looked at any of the Indian um, cases or the Indian constitution. It's very similar to our constitution. And they have read into their equivalent of Section 7 um, a right to health. They've read it into the right to life. And they have a number of cases that have emerged out of um, their conception of a right to health out of the right to life. So I think that's a really... You know, they're in a very different context, obviously. But as I said, it's not enough, enough right? It's the, the huge gap between the wealthy um, who have access to some of the best state-of-the-art healthcare in the world in India. In fact, many of, of many North Americans travel there as, for, as medical tourists to access that care, and the rest, you know, can't even get basic primary mm -hmm. and preventive care. Yeah. I'm wondering about the extent to which you looked at the broader economic variables which might be undermining the court's ability to um, mm -hmm. consider positive health rates. Um, for example, you know, to the extent to which a lot of countries are becoming involved in trade pacts which privilege uh, economic rights, this really diminishes any ability of courts to think about positive health rights. And that's the best example of that is the European community mm -hmm. where you have the economic rights of patients and providers. Yeah. But of course, this has at the same time undermined that sovereignty of the policy. Yeah. Yeah, and that is, um, we, well, I didn't go into all of the stuff that we tried to deal with. We just tried to deal with too much. So that is absolutely true. So the, the free trade agreements uh, are making it, uh, in some circumstances, more difficult to maintain solidarity and equity objectives. We are seeing that in the European Union uh, with cases so that people can cross borders and access health care. So if you're in France and you're sick of waiting, uh, you know, you can go to Italy, you can go to the Netherlands, et cetera, et cetera. And then you bring the bill back home to your insurer. And that's part of the free trade um, modality. And that sounds pretty good. You know, from a lot of perspective, that sounds pretty good from a consumer perspective. You know, I'm sitting in a wait queue and... Uh, in Nova Scotia, or well, stuff that I'll just nip over to Alberta. They don't really have much of a wait for hip, knee, and joint, so why don't I? And just send the bill back to Nova Scotia. So get on with it, buddies. You know, I, in some ways I kind of like it. But then on the other hand, it really puts a lot of pressure on the public system back at home that might be not the right kind of pressure. So um, I think the European Union and the European Court of Justice, as they've been ruling on these cases, are starting to actually. They are, their understanding is improving of the negative impact and you're starting to see a bit more of a recognition that actually we do actually have to be careful that the home jurisdictions can maintain solidarity and equity. And of course as more, uh, you know, less resourced countries join the European Union that's much more problematic for them 
as they try to maintain a public system, but they've got, you know, the their individual people in the in their healthcare system saying, well, this isn't this is not good. I could go to England and have some fancy dancy treatment. So I will, and I'll bring the bill back home to Hungary, for example. Right. So uh, th I think there's a bit of a more of a recognition now and a bit of a movement away. So I know, for example, in the Netherlands, you can't go uh, for hospital treatment now that the European Court of Justice has ruled in favour of the Dutch so resisting that. Although at the same time you have the European semester system in which it's the European Commission, which can tell countries that they yep. have to mobilise. No, absolutely. So your larger point is correct though, right? I, I've given you too much detail about the European jurisdiction, but your larger point is absolutely correct. It puts more pressure on um, countries trying to maintain solidarity and equity. So it's really important in negotiating free trade agreements, obviously, that, um, that countries that do that make sure that they uh, create or en enable themselves to protect their public health care systems. Unfortunately, you know, ministers of health and those who know about this sort of thing are not often at the negotiating table. It's usually the pointy-headed people from industry and trade, you know, diddly squat about the health care system. So um, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, one of the big things on the table, I'm originally from New Zealand, is our is Pharmac, the public and the pr prescription drug insurance um, plan which aggressively negotiates prices with pharmaceutical companies and the Americans want New Zealanders to give up Pharmac as part of the free trade agreement and they may do if we get enough access for our sheep <laughs> but again you know it's really got to be worth it because that's a big loss there's got to be a lot of sheep <laughs> Joanna build on um, Jocelyn's um, question a little bit because I was thinking during the presentation is this really a question about the judicialization of health rights rather than a project about health rights per se and if so then it becomes a question about institutions and the capacity of institutions so I think the idea here is that you know courts are reactive to a degree they can't just weigh in on public policy they need a case to be brought before and so the structuring of the case if you the, the way in which the rights are written and the ideology underlying the Constitution is going to dictate the way the case comes forward to them that they can then respond on. Mm -hmm. So I guess this then is a question uh, where I think then the, the, the idea of what, uh, what is the uh, orientation of the Constitution against which courts have to act, right? That's mm -hmm. their only avenue in. Mm -hmm. So then is the question about trying to move away from constitutional rights to do this kind of work. Um, that it's better, as you said, to see these as admin principles. You know, a number of the cases that were described were not on rights-based grounds that may have had some of the progressive effects um, that you were looking at. So what, yeah. I mean, if this is a project about what the institution of a court can do vis-a-vis -vis health rights, mm. then it seems like maybe it's a different kind, or even what the courts can do vis-a-vis -vis not health rights, but vis-a-vis -vis health care systems or health policy which is a totally different question than health rights, right? Well, see, there I really disagree. Because health rights, that's, that health rights to me will interact with the healthcare system. So we see in Colombia, the judicialization and determination around healthcare rights has fundamentally changed the healthcare system. So, you know, I think that's the thing is that courts, judges may sometimes think they're, you know, making a decision, they're not making a decision about policy. But over time, in enough decisions, you make on an individual basis, you make a decision about policy. Um, so, uh, back, but your bigger question about is it just is it a, a project about institutions or is it a project about healthcare rights? It's a project about both. I mean, it, we are interested, um, and perhaps it shouldn't be. You know, per perhaps we should be disaggregating all of this. But in this first kind of pass. We've, I've tried, we've tried to do everything. So we've looked at how healthcare rights are articulated, you know, where they are, are they in the constitution, are they inferred, are they in statute, are they, are they not, are they just part of general policy. We've looked at the institutions themselves in the sense of, you know, how, how a case is brought, is it public interest litigation as in India, is it the Tutala action in Colombia, you know, how are these pro bono, you know, how are these things brought to court? Um, then how have courts reacted to all of this in their decision making? But the, you know, the, and, you know as I said, with uh, the range, the breadth of what we're looking at is enormous. 
um, so Colombia, a million cases, and uh, New Zealand, probably two that are of relevance. But one, you know, you have a right to health care, and other, you don't. Um, so you, you're just sort of trying to find a right somewhere in the ether um, that doesn't, isn't constitutionalized. So I guess at this point, you know, I've kind of come out of the end of the sausage making factory, and I'm not sure about the shape of my sausage. <laughs> And, but I, I think I have, you know, well, first of all, it's been a fascinating journey. My God. And it's been my first foray into middle income and developing countries. And I think I'm going to stay there for a while. It's just, they're just, it's just fabulous, you know, and what they're trying to achieve animates me. So how can they achieve that? And then what can I bring back from that experience to think about the Canadian modality? But, you know, more, you know, very narrowly, I think one of the things I really want to do now is really roll my sleeves up and really start looking hard at the Indian cases and the Indian context and how, why have they come to a point with their equivalent, it's really word for word, of their sec of Section 7, to infer a positive right to health care, and we are not, haven't as yet. Um, and, you know, as you know, there's a, a, a big case coming up around... Um, challenging the conservative government's move to de-insure refugees, right? So basically, if a refugees from so-called safe countries like Hungary and um, so forth, or Mexico, will have no rights to health care, have no rights to health care, none at all, not even emergency care, pregnancy care, nothing. So that constitutional challenge is happening now. I suspect um, they might be able to dispose of it on a Section 15 analysis, so they may not have to go the distance on a Section 7, um, but at some point we will get those right facts up before the Supreme Court on a Section 7. And so that would be the moment to really say, hey, how about, how about doing what we did, what has been done in the Indian mm -hmm. Supreme Court? So I think, so what we did do was a combination of things, but we could certainly disaggregate them for further and better study, undoubtedly. Diana. Um, in your own earlier analysis of Shelley, Shelley, although you said it a bit more politely, you basically said the court understood the newly squat about the international comparison. Yeah. Did, did, you, did this study look at the extent to which courts were looking at international comparisons and the extent to which they were certainly sort of looking at it today? Uh, no, we didn't particularly get into that granularity because, um, well, Canada is a bit of an. Um, outlier in the sense of using um, a constitutional right to health um, for the specifically uh, regressive ends, right, to actually undo laws and policies that are protecting the public health care system. Um, but no, you, no you, uh, well, I don't think, no, we didn't. But it's a good point. So I was just thinking that's not actually totally true because there are other cases. So it was the Israel, Israelis allowing, um, uh, well, not overturning the decision to put in place all these co-payments and stuff like that, which is clearly regressive. And probably international evidence could have been brought to bear on that as well, the extent to which other systems allow co-payments. Um, so no, we didn't. Um, and I'm um, not, well, um, I'm hoping though that this time round that they will take better account of the international evidence around how different jurisdictions regulate the public-private divide. So um, a lot of uh, affidavits have been filed in the Brian Day case. This is the case that's happening in British Columbia that's the equivalent of Shayuli. And Brian Day is challenging all of the laws that protect the public health care system, um, such as the law that bans private health insurance, the law that bans extra billing, so where a physician gets the money from the government and then charges you whatever he or she wishes on top of it, and the, and the law that says that physicians either have to work for the public system or opt out and work for the private sector, but they can't have both. So Brian Day, uh, who owns a private clinic out in uh, BC, is challenging all of those laws. So it's actually quite a complicated um, comparative endeavour as well, because in the Shailu decision it was just the one law banning private health insurance. In this case it's all of these different laws, about five of them. 
And so there are f you know, basically five buckets of comparative work that need to be done to justify each and every one of them. And the tricky thing is, is that you know, we don't usually do a randomized controlled trial with a healthcare system. Right? We're going to make you have a co-payment and you not. It, that generally doesn't work. So it's actually really difficult to bring very strong scientific evidence to bear on this. It's mostly sort of observational. You know, it's not generally seen as particularly um, strong evidence. Nonetheless, there is evidence, but it's not generally viewed as very strong. And of course, the burden of proof, uh, once we get to, you know, if they prove a prima facie breach of Section 7, then the burden of proof is on the government. And so the government is going to have to show that notwithstanding the infringement of your Section 7 right, your right to buy private health care in a timely way, it is uh, justifiable. So they have an uphill battle. Sheila. One of the things that I heard you pulling out of this wide-ranging, complex uh, study that you've been involved uh, with uh, was a kind of Kind of like a pulling back to the, the process substance yeah. distinction. Oh yes, and I'm sorry, I didn't answer that probably for right, you. That's, I guess it's bringing you back to it. So you, you're putting a lot of, um, uh, I don't know if you'd say faith or you know, sort of. Yeah. A, a look, I suppose. Uh, uh, I'm putting a lot of I'm putting the if and in process, basis. In, in, right? <laughs> yeah, in process. And so, of course, historically, um, human rights lawyers or progressive types yeah. have been pretty frustrated with admin law. In yeah. part because of its emphasis on process, this idea that what judges do is sort of supervise the boundaries of the more political mm -hmm. or policy based mm -hmm. sort of decisions that folks with the discretion to make those decisions make. And it's kind of a refereeing the outer limits of things without getting much, you know, uh, much of a hook into the mm -hmm. substantive human rights issues that may be alive in administrative contexts. And so now coming through all of this, yeah. you're coming back to especially out of com the, the Colombian um, example that you gave us, yeah. coming back to processes, maybe having more potential than we might see. So I'd just like to hear more about that, yeah. whether in relation to actually Colombia specifically uh, yeah. or, or other yeah. contexts as well. No, so, um, so the, the administrative part of this, or the administrative law part of this, um, I, I think I've got to a place where I think we need a constitutional right, a positive constitutional right to health care, but that it should be, in a sense, a backstop. So that administrative law should really do most of the work. But then, you know, in the case where you've got an Mbeki who's an AIDS denialist, or a Harper who's trying to cut off refugees, Basically, you need, and I just put them in the same category just to make sure you understand where I stand on this, <laughs> that, um, that you, need a, you need a constitutional right to health care to counter some of this very egregious sort of activity. Um, but uh, for the day-to-day -day decision making, um, part of the problem in the health care systems as I see them uh, is there is a lack of accountability for decision making. Right? Who makes, uh, who do you, who do you, uh, you know, where do you go to and who do you go to if some, if for some reason you're not getting timely treatment? Who do you complain to? Whose fault is it? Where do I go? How do I know if a decision has been made fairly? You know, should I just be a patient patient or should I be really railing at the gates? And I think that administrative law, well, you know, a version of administrative law has a, a big role to play, uh, particularly now in our Canadian healthcare system, but in other systems as well, to try to grow those sorts of structures that need to be in place so that there is fair and dis transparent and open decision making. I think that's the best that we can do. Because when we try to think about, well, um, what should be um, the content, the specific content of a health human right, should you have that expensive cancer drug? Uh, should you have this uh, PET scan? You know, this MRI, this, this or that? I mean, basically, we're, not basically, but where we have endeavoured to try to actually articulate a list, it is, um, it never works. I mean, we may be able to come up with a very basic list of, you know, absolutely critical services that everybody should have across time and space. But it has to be sort of a floating thing because what is a health human right in Canada is going to be different from what it is in Nigeria. 
right? I should, I'm, as a Canadian citizen, a health human right may mean that I actually have access to some fairly expensive end-of-life procedure or cancer drugs. It will not in Nigeria. So what I need then is a reasonable process. I need to make sure that the institutions, as Jonah is talking about, um, the processes are fair and that things can evolve over time and space. Right? What is fair today will not be fair tomorrow, necessarily, depending on the resources and the context and so forth. So I think that even although it is no perfect solution, absolutely, it's the best legal solution we have. Plus, it's administrative law. <laughs> okay. Are no other questions? Last burning question. Just one more mark. Oh, one more question. Yeah, okay. 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 Um, no, I don't think so. It all depends. I mean, a right to health, a right to health care, um, in and of itself, is just a form. What really matters is what is in it. How do you populate it, and what goes in it? Um, so yes, I think you know. The to the extent that if you get something in Alberta and you're not getting it in Nova Scotia, that can be problematic. Um, and that can cause political pressure from Nova Scotians to say, well, the Albertans are getting, you know, their fancy-dancy PET scans every five minutes. We want them too. Um, so again, though, you have to have, I think, a sense of um, within our resources and our system, what is fair and reasonable? Right? What, what, what is appropriate for me to be able to have? And that's a kind of conversation that we haven't really been very comfortable with having. We like to believe that we should be able to have everything and anything. And there is this kind of cultural sense that all health care is good, all drugs are great. Uh, this is simply not true. Um, so we need to have those kinds of conversations. We need to have the sort of institutions that are set up that, uh, to allow us to have these kinds of conversations, to enable us to acknowledge the fact that we, you know, we only will have a certain number of resources to spend on healthcare, or we're rating it from education or social services or we're increasing taxes. Take your pick. So those are our options. Um, and it may be, you know, okay that we agree that we should raid from healthcare and social services or we should pay more taxes, but we need to have that kind of conversation. So I don't think that there's a problem with uh, finding at a, you know, at a constitutional level a right to health. It's what you do with it, what the court does with it, what we do with it that then will be important. Okay. Okay, so uh, before I formally thank um, Colleen for her lecture today, let me first thank all of you uh, for supporting our seminar series today. And in the past, some of you perhaps were in attendance all those 17 years ago when the series was hatched from Dr. Flett's brain uh, with a little help from her friends. Uh, special thanks also to our historic and ongoing partners like Chris Connell and the Health Research Foundation. Special thanks also to Elaine Gibson, uh, my predecessor as an associate director who inherited the lecture series from Colleen and who shaped it into the success that it's become. Most profound thanks to Barbara Carter. Is Barbara oh, yes. in the room? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm so sorry she's not. Um, Barbara Carter has done all of the behind the scenes work. Um, every year since this seminar series started with unflagging dedication. So she makes sure the posters are printed and the e-notices are out and the signage is up and everyone's fed uh, and seated and happy. Um, or if they're not happy, at least they're better informed uh, than when they arrived. Uh, so thank you, Barbara Carter, even in uh, your absence now. And last but clearly not least, um, thanks to Colleen Flood for her as ever thought-provoking wide-ranging, challenging, engaging lecture today.